Section 4. Exchange Rate Regimes Every exchange rate is managed to some degree by central banks. The policy framework adopted by a central bank is called the exchange rate regime. Before we talk about the different exchange rate regimes, let's look at the properties of an ideal exchange rate regime. The curriculum talks about three major properties. The first one is that the exchange rate between any two currencies would be credibly fixed. In other words, if you have two currencies A and B, ideally there should be a fixed exchange rate between these two currencies that would avoid foreign exchange risk and this should be credible. In other words, the counterparties should trust the fact that this exchange rate will hold. All currencies would be fully convertible. This is fairly obvious. You would want to convert any currency into any other currency very easily. And finally, each country would be able to undertake fully independent monetary policy. Clearly, these three represent an ideal scenario, but one and three cannot happen at the same time. So any currency regime would require some trade-off. And as we look at the spectrum of different regimes, that spectrum effectively involves some sort of a trade-off between the ideal scenario or the properties that we see over here. Section 4.2 in the curriculum talks about the historical perspective on currency regimes. This is not mentioned in the learning objectives and I don't see any examples or practice problems on this either, but I think it is interesting and for finance professionals it is useful to know the, the very brief history and I will share that with you. For most of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, in fact up to 1943, the world largely operated on the gold standard. In other words, currencies such as the dollar and the pound were based on gold reserves. And then if other currencies were based on the dollar or the pound, then indirectly they were also based on the gold standard. Then in 1943, the Bretton Woods Agreement took place where the gold standard was abandoned and major currencies moved into what can be roughly described as a fixed parity or fixed rate system. That lasted till about the early 1970s. With the fixed parity system, there were issues with countries not being able to exert their monetary policy independently. There were inflation problems and so on. And then after the 70s, most of the major economies moved towards a free float system. That's all I'll say at this stage. Now what we'll do is talk about the various exchange rate regimes, their similarities and differences, and that is what you are likely to be tested on. Here are the various regimes, and you will notice that these regimes span a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, we will have rates which are fixed against another major currency such as the dollar or the euro. And at the other end of the spectrum, we'll have rates or exchange rates which are completely floating. Now let's start at this end of the spectrum. The extreme here is that a country does not have its own currency, no separate legal tender. And there are two ways that can happen. One is dollarization, where a country such as Panama says that we do not have our own currency, we will simply use the US dollar. So effectively, this country does not need to have a monetary policy of its own. It simply imports the currency and the monetary policy of the United States. Another scenario is a monetary union and the classic example is the Eurozone where countries in the Eurozone have adopted a single currency called the Euro. Here the issue is that a country like Greece now, for example, which is part of the Eurozone, 
cannot print its own money, it cannot exert its independent monetary policy. Then we get into the currency board system where the country has its own currency but an explicit legislative commitment is made to exchange the domestic currency for a specified foreign currency at a fixed exchange rate. The classic example of this is the Hong Kong dollar where there is a legislative commitment to maintain a certain exchange rate between the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar. This commitment does allow for a very small ban. So there will be a certain exchange rate and it will be allowed to fluctuate just a little bit around that rate. Key point though is that this is a legislative commitment. So it is very credible. The next one is fixed parity. So we are slowly moving from left to right on this spectrum. With fixed parity, a country pegs its currency with a band of approximately 1% versus another currency. But the difference between fixed parity and currency board is that with fixed parity, there is no legislative commitment. That's one difference. The other difference is that here, the level of foreign exchange reserves held by the country are discretionary. An example of a country which does this is Saudi Arabia. Next is target zone, which is like fixed parity, but with wider bands. Here we had 1% bands. Here we typically have a plus minus 2% band, which gives the monetary authority a little more flexibility. Active and passive crawling peg. This is where the currency is pegged against another currency. So on the fixed to flexible spectrum, we are still closer to the fixed side, but moving towards more flexibility by saying that the peg can crawl. In other words, there is a peg, but that peg or exchange rate is allowed to slowly move in whatever direction is necessary. The exchange rate is adjusted frequently to keep pace with inflation. And when this happens, we say we have a passive crawl. At times, the monetary authority will pre-announce what the pegs will be for the upcoming days or weeks. And that is called an active crawl. This helps set expectations about exchange rates. The next level is fixed parity with crawling bands. In other words, we have the parity established, but the bands are flexible. This allows for a gradual exit strategy from fixed parity. And then we come closer towards the flexible system. Manage float, exchange rate policy based on either internal or external policy targets. Intervening or not, and this is the central bank, decides to intervene or not to achieve trade balance, price stability or employment objectives. In other words, the central bank has certain policy targets and objectives and it decides whether or not to interfere with exchange rates in order to meet its objectives. And finally, independently floating rates. Here the exchange rate is completely left to the market. The monetary authority is able to exercise independent monetary policy aimed at achieving such objectives as price stability and full employment. This, by the way, is also called a dirty float because the currency is floating, but with some intervention, so it is not completely clean. Here I have reproduced exhibit eight from the curriculum. You don't really need to remember the facts over here, but I think it is interesting to know what types of regimes exist in different countries. I mentioned Ecuador or Panama earlier. So here we have dollarization, monetary union. This is the European monetary union or the Eurozone. These are the countries in the Eurozone, at least at this point in time. 
currency board big examples are hong kong which is tied to the dollar and then we have some countries which are tied to the euro these are examples of fixed parity against the dollar fixed parity against the euro and then here are some other well known examples notice that outside the eurozone a lot of countries now follow the independent float system here are some excerpts from example 7 and i insist that you do this example because it will give you a sense for what you might see on the exam and the small excerpt here is just to get you started we have a client and her advisor who are discussing potential investments in hong kong panama and canada note that the question will tell you what sort of regime exists in what country you are not expected to remember this information we are told that hong kong has a currency board system panama has dollarization and canada has free float and then let's look at these comments or these questions based solely on the exchange rate risk the client would face What is the correct ranking from most to least risky of the following investment locations and those are the three locations from a exchange rate risk perspective for a US based client Canada would be the most risky because Canada follows a free float system so the exchange rate between the Canadian dollar and the US dollar is likely to fluctuate more than the exchange rate between the US dollar and these currencies so highest exchange rate risk over here then hong kong because hong kong has the currency board which is fixed but allows for very small deviations panama is dollarized so there the currency is the dollar and we would have no exchange rate risk so greatest risk with canada and the least risk in fact no risk with panama based solely on their foreign exchange regimes which country is least likely to import inflation or deflation from the united states this is also an important point the country that will import the most inflation is the country that follows the us currency so panama uses dollars so here they would be the most inflation hong kong is practically pegged to the dollar so inflation will be imported here also Canada is on the free float regime so Canada will exert its own policy and Canada therefore is least likely to import inflation or deflation from the United States true or false a fixed parity regime means a constant exchange rate and is more credible than a currency board this is false constant exchange rate this is not exactly true even with a fixed parity system we do have some bands so it doesn't mean a constant exchange rate more credible than a currency board this is also false because remember with a currency board we have a legislative commitment whereas with fixed parity we do not have a legislative commitment